Well, good evening. I'm David Deffenbaugh, and I am very glad to be with you, if you can call this being with you, uh, at Windsong uh, tonight. Uh, I have I have been familiar with the Winsong congregation for a very long time. As a matter of fact, I I knew Winsong before it was Winsong. I've been getting your church bulletin for years. I feel almost like that old episode of the Andy Griffith show where this stranger shows up in town and he knows everybody's name and he knows personal information about all these people and he's really freaking people out and uh, Barney, of course, thinks he's some kind of a foreign spy. It turns out he had a buddy in the army who was from Mayberry, and he had been reading the Mayberry newspaper for years, so he knew about everybody. Well, I've been reading your bulletin for years, and so I have kept up with Winsong. But not only that, a couple of years ago, we were on vacation. We we're actually returning home. I was preaching uh, in Oklahoma City at the time, and we stopped by, dropped in at Winsong on a Sunday morning. And I've got to tell you, that was such a positive experience. And and I'm not just saying that. I've actually said that many times to many different people. Uh, you were so warm and welcoming, and you know. Could be you were just really on your game that day, or you just really are a warm and welcoming church. And I prefer to think that that's exactly the case. Uh, it was really the first time that I had uh, gotten to meet Keith in person, and we've kind of kept up with each other, see each other now and again uh, over time since then. And so I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be with you uh, in this study tonight. Uh, you know, I am like pretty much everybody else. I like easy. I drive my car to the church office every day as opposed to walking. I could walk, but it's a lot easier to drive. Uh, our house is like your house, I'm sure. We have electric lights because that's a whole lot easier than kerosene lanterns and candles. Uh, we have indoor plumbing, which means you don't have to go out to a well to draw water or go out to a little outbuilding out behind the house when you've got to do that. Uh, it's, it's easy. We like easy. We prefer easy. And so much of our lives have become just that. But, you know, easy is not always better. Uh, as a matter of fact, we could go on a bit of a rant here, I suppose, and, and talk about how the ease of our world has had a very negative impact on humanity. Uh, we could talk about uh, how it's made us soft and undisciplined and weak and vulnerable and all of those kinds of things. But it is true that sometimes ease leads to complacency and the elevating of convenience to a much higher place than it actually deserves to be. Uh, we are a people who love our routines. Uh, and the reason we love our routines is because we have found these to be easiest. We have found these because they are routine and the familiarity, uh, we're very comfortable with them. You don't believe that, just upset the routine and see how upset we get when that happens. Well, uh, we're in the middle of that, aren't we? This whole COVID pandemic thing has caused us to have to get out of our routines. Now, if we know there is a reason why, we can do things that otherwise we would consider to be inconvenient or not easy, but if there's a good reason for it, then we'll pursue that thing. Well, we are in a situation that has forced us as churches to, to do things like we've never done them before. I mean, for crying out loud, here we are doing summer series. I'm on video, pre-recorded this several days ago, and you're watching it now probably from home. Uh, and a year ago, to say to suggest that that's how things were going to play out, we would have said that that's crazy. We we would never do that. We would never buy that. But here we are doing that very thing. Our Sundays are very different, aren't they? I mean, we've spent our whole life Sunday morning, 
uh, Bible class, worship, Sunday evening, we come back, Wednesday night, we come back, but we're not doing those things right now. You, I'm sure, were like uh, us at Center Hill in Paragool, where for several weeks it was all online. We have gone back recently to having a live service on Sunday, but it's just one. Our numbers are sitting right about 30 or 40 percent of what was our typical attendance. We're only meeting that time. We're not having live Bible classes. We're not coming back on Sunday night. And so we are having to do things differently than we've done them before. Now, you you don't need me adding another voice to the commentary that, that we very regularly hear. Yes, there are probably some people who are going to say, well, you know, I just found it a whole lot more convenient and easy to worship at home in my pajamas on the couch uh, rather than to come back to the assembly. And so it may take a while for us to, to get some folks back, unfortunately, but that's probably going to be the case. Uh, so easy is not always better. Now, what's the point of all of this? Uh, the point of all of this is that faith is not easy. Now, it is true that man has tended to complicate the simplicity of the faith of Jesus Christ. But there's a difference between simple and easy. Uh, simple is not always easy. Uh, how, how, <laughs> how do you lose weight? Well, it's simple. You just eat less and you exercise more. But it's not easy, is it? Um, I can bear personal testimony to that, as I think most of us probably can. Uh, it is a defendable claim that man has complicated the faith. But the fact remains that Jesus himself told us that the faith is not easy. Some very familiar words from Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And so, Christianity, that way of life, that, that way of, um, that mode of existing has come to be called the straight and narrow. But, you know, I think we have many times not rightly understood what Jesus was saying due to a misspelling, a misspelling in our own minds. Because when Jesus says straight, He's not using the word that is spelled S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. He's using the word straight spelled S-T-R-A-I-T. Now, when you look that word up in the dictionary, it means that which is difficult, strict, or rigorous. And so you can read some translations that, that don't use that same termolo ter terminology that the King James Version uses. It uses words like the way is hard, the way is difficult. Jesus said the faith is not easy. Now here's our question. How can we successfully pursue something or achieve something that we know ahead of time is difficult? Well, we can. And I think the answer to that is found in the text for our study tonight, and that is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We turn to that passage and we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The way we're able 
to achieve or accomplish something that we know is difficult is by looking to Jesus. That is to fix our eyes on Jesus. Jesus becomes our why. Jesus becomes the reason we're able to do what we are called upon to do, even though at times it is very challenging and very difficult. But we must fix our eyes on him. Now, I want us to think about this in the, in the very language used here by the Hebrew writer in this passage. When, when we look at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, we recognize that it is coming immediately on the heels of Hebrews chapter 11, because 12 follows 11. But we're very familiar with Hebrews 11, aren't we? That's the great faith chapter of the Bible. We have, it's sometimes called the, the Faith Hall of Fame. But Hebrews 11 follows Hebrews chapter 10. And at the end of Hebrews chapter 10, we find the writer of Hebrews encouraging those to whom he is writing. And listen to these words, starting in verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction. This, we jump down to verse 39. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. You have need of endurance, the writer says. And the faith that we have, we're not going to shrink back. We're not going to throw this away. But we have a faith that is to the preserving of the soul. And then that's where he immediately then launches into chapter 11, which is what? The great faith chapter. What does the faith to the preserving of the soul look like? Here it is. In, in one sense, when you, when you look at the flow of thought through the book of Hebrews, in one sense, Hebrews chapter 11 is an extended illustration or demonstration of what faith is because he's telling these people and encouraging these people, you need to persevere. That's, that's what you need to do in light of your circumstances. You need to persevere and have the faith that preserves the full. So that's what this faith looks like. And then chapter 12 begins with, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run, or excuse me, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with endurance. That's what he told them back at the end of chapter 10. Run with endurance. And so he's saying it again. Run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now let's look a little bit more closely at that. I, I typically use the English Standard Version in my reading and study, most for the most part. Uh, but I think this translation failed us here uh, in this very phrase because it translates this phrase as look to Jesus. But we've got to understand what's behind that. And I think the idea or, or the words fix your eyes on Jesus comes a lot closer to expressing what really is being said here because the Hebrew writer uses a very specific word. It's only used one other time in the New Testament and that by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2. As a matter of fact, in chapter 11, we find this said in verse 26, talking about Moses and his faith. He was one who was looking to the reward. But the word that is used there for looking to the reward is different than the word that is used here in verse 2 of chapter 12 about looking to Jesus or fixing your eyes on Jesus. You see, this word means, and this is, a, this is Thayer's translation of it, to turn your eyes away from other things and fix them on something. Or as William Mounts defines this term, 
to view with undivided attention by looking away from every other object. So you are hyper attentive to something. And because you are, nothing else is distracting you. You're not looking at anything else at all but this. I can remember uh, being an 18-year-old. And as an 18-year-old, I was primarily interested in two things. One was football, and the other was girls. I was 18. Uh, but I remember... I very distinctly remember a day when that changed for me. It was, I was attending a wedding. Uh, it was a wedding in which the two very good family friends uh, were getting married. Uh, my brother was one of the groomsmen. Uh, my sister was the maid of honor in this wedding. So uh, this was that kind of a, a situation. But anyway, I was at that wedding. And after the wedding, I remember I was walking down the aisle. And it took place in the church building uh, in Neosho, Missouri, where my dad preached. And and I, I looked down. It was, it was all done and over. And people were just standing around talking. I looked down that aisle through the doors that were propped open. Uh, at the back of the auditorium, and there stood a girl. Now, I knew this girl. I was familiar with her. As a matter of fact, I had dated her best friend uh, earlier. Um, but I, I, I saw Tanya that day, and my eyes became fixed on her. You know, did this very same idea. Looking away from all others, I was no longer interested in any other girl, and I have not ever been since that day. I was fixed on her. You know, sometimes we use that term uh, to someone to describe an, emo an emotional state someone is in. They are fixated. They are, they are attentive to one thing to the exclusion of everything else. Now, in a lot of circumstances, that can be a very negative thing. But that idea is here, and it's a very good thing that our eyes are fixed on Jesus. Now, from this point, we could go several directions. And I'll just tell you, I have gone several directions with this text in the past. You know, Keith in, invited me with the, our other, the other speakers in this spirit series to speak, you know, your favorite sermon. Uh, well, this is a sermon that I have preached in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different contexts. I've used it as the basis of a whole series of lessons. You know, from this point, we could go the direction of, okay, so if we're to look away from other things to fix our eyes on Jesus, what is it that we should be looking away from? We could talk about that. Um, or we can talk about, okay, so when we look at Jesus, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, what do we see when we do that? Uh, that's a, an interesting line of thought as well. But, but what I want us to do tonight for the remainder of our time is to think about, okay, what does it mean to fix our eyes on Jesus? You know, because it's very possible that we think we are doing something when we are not doing it at all. And so we've got to understand what it means to fix our eyes on Jesus. Now I want to ask you a question to get us started here. Would you recognize Jesus if you saw him? Now, there is literally a visual representation of Jesus that's been around for a long time, and it is so widespread and so ingrained in at least Western culture that we can see this picture of this person, and we look at that, and if someone said, who is this, what would we say? We'd say, well, that's Jesus. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you and I were able to lay eyes on Jesus and what he looked like, we wouldn't recognize him. As a matter of fact, you, you may have seen this before. There is, There has been an effort made um, by somebody, I couldn't even say who, but to, to show us what Jesus probably would have looked like as a first century Palestinian Jew. And he would have probably looked much more like this 
rather than the picture that we are so familiar with. Now, what I am suggesting to you here uh, as a physical, visible representation of Jesus, I want us to think about that in terms of a mental picture of Jesus, a mental representation of what Jesus is like. And when we are saying we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, we're going to fix our mind on Jesus, what comes to our mind is that really Jesus that we are fixing our minds on. You see, in order to do what we're encouraged to do in Hebrews chapter 12, fix our eyes on Jesus, we have to see and understand Jesus as he has been made known, as he has been revealed to us. Now, how do you do that? Well, there's only one source that is able to show us what Jesus really was like. And that, of course, is the Bible. That, that, that Scripture itself is going to show us what Jesus was like. And so when we think of Jesus and, and, and we formulate our ideas about him in our minds, then it has to be shaped and formed for us by what Scripture actually tells us about Jesus. Now, here's what we have to recognize, is that there has been a fundamental shift in how our nation, our culture, views the Bible. There was a time when... Uh, and, and it's still true in some places, but this is not true in a lot of places. And that is that an understanding that the Bible is God's Word and that we can rely on the Bible and what it tells us as being accurate and true and real and right and all those kinds of things. As a matter of fact, uh, in this regard, there is an influence, and that, that's too weak, but there is an influence in our culture that has become the dominant influence. It has become the most common and popular influence that says that what you can't trust what you read about in the Bible. And particularly in terms of Jesus himself, that the picture of Jesus in Scripture is what has been called the Jesus of faith. That is, that the picture of Jesus that's presented there is not a real and accurate and historical description of Jesus, of what he said and what he did, but rather it is the ideas that were formulated people who followed him, uh, who conjured up this concept of what they wanted this Messiah to be like, and so they, in essence, created these stories about him. And, and they say that's what made its way into the Bible. Now, that, that whole concept, that whole approach, or that way of thinking probably seems very foreign to most all of us, but that is what is out there, and that is what uh, the present generation is being exposed to. And so they're, they're being told you can't trust the Bible, you can't rely on the Bible, you can't believe what the Bible says about Jesus. Now, we, we could go off on that for quite some time, and we need to. We have to equip ourselves, and we have to equip the up-and-coming generations to be able to defend Scripture as being historically accurate and real, and that we can believe what it tells us and as what we're concerned with tonight. Well, we can believe what it tells us about Jesus so, if we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, then we're going to have to look at what Jesus really looked like, mentally speaking. That is, we're going to have to look at Jesus as he really was. And the only way we can know what Jesus really was is to look at Scripture, to look at the Bible. We have to see him as he has been revealed to us. And so we have to concern ourselves then with a very consistent and persistent investigation and look into the Gospels. 
as we look at them. They, four Gospels to show us what God wants us to know about Jesus. And those Gospels then are also tied then to every other book of the Bible because they also are engaged in the process of revealing Jesus to us. Now, the second thing I want to say here about what it means to fix our eyes on Jesus is closely related to that. And it is that we have to be sure that we're not just looking at my Jesus. Now, now what I mean by that is when I think about Jesus, what do I think about? Uh, and it is, it, is, it is a fact that what many people see when they look at Jesus is something or someone who is remarkably like they are. Now, there's one of two possibilities there. That they're seeing someone who is remarkably like they are because they have so conformed to the image of Jesus Christ that they have become that much like him. But that's not typically what happens, I don't, I don't believe. Uh, instead, I think what is happening is that we are we are conforming Jesus to be like us. That we Sorry, be, we begin to that. think of Jesus as being someone who thinks like we do, who has the same kind of attitudes that we have, uh, who approaches things just like we approach them. Uh, and what literally happens, I'm afraid, a majority of the time is that people conform Jesus to be like themselves instead of them being conformed to become like Jesus. I think we would be naive at best and rather we would be foolish to deny the possibility of that even happening and being on and honest enough to recognize that sometimes it even happens with us. When, when we think about Jesus, we may prefer to think about Jesus meek and gentle. We think of the figure who's carrying a, a vulnerable, helpless lamb in his arms. And there's nothing wrong with that picture because he is, he is that uh, in Scripture, isn't he? Isaiah the prophet talks about taking the, 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 the nursing you into his arms and caring for them. And, um, but Jesus is also the one who fashioned a whip to drive the money changers out of the table, to upset their tables, to turn them over. And it's not that Jesus was this or he was that. He was all of that and more. <laughs> and we can't be selective in deciding, well, I like this Jesus, but I really don't care for that Jesus. That option is not open to us. You know, we might think about Jesus as being the one who sat and conversed with religious leaders of his day, the theologians of his day, and they had these deep, meaningful conversations and discussions, and he was moving in and among those circles. But what actually we find Jesus, or what Scripture shows us is Jesus is among people who were, who were not highly regarded and respected. Uh, Jesus, at times, conversed with prostitutes and with people who were held in very low regard. Uh, he, he associated with people that other folks, respectable folks, tended to distance themselves from and yet Jesus was engaging these people. You see, sometimes Jesus said and did things that make us uncomfortable because they are not the kinds of things that we would say or that we would do. So what's going to happen here? Are we going to formulate a Jesus that is much more like we are? Or are we going to be conformed so that we become much more like him? Fix your eyes on Jesus. That means that we cannot just fix our eyes on 
my Jesus. We have to fix our eyes on the Jesus. Now, there's one other thing I want us to do this evening. Uh, and again, this is a point at which we could go on for a very long time. And I would encourage you to even do that in your own private devotions and studies. But since this is, is something that's taken from uh, the book of the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, fix your eyes on Jesus, verse 2. Let's go back to the very beginning of this book where the writer begins with Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited, which is more excellent than theirs. I mean, that is, that, that, that passage, I'll just tell you, that passage is at the deep end of the pool. Uh, that passage is not frivolous, it's not shallow. Uh, that's a passage where we could spend and should spend our lifetime delving into the depths of what we're being told there. And yet here we are, we're going to try to wrap up this lesson in this few minutes tonight with that passage. But in it, here's what I want us to see. In it, we see some critical things about Jesus. First of all, he says, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we're going to hear God because he says God has spoken. He's spoken in this way in the past to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we're fixated on him. We're going to hear God. We're going to hear what God wants us to hear and to know. Another thing that we're going to that is going to happen is we're going to see our creator. Jesus is our creator. He made us. And the implications of the creation, the creator and what was created are very far reaching. And again, we could spend a lot of time here and we should spend time here, but we're not going to be able to tonight. But he's our creator. That means everything. Not only that, by fixing our eyes on Jesus, we are exposed to the radiance of God's glory. You want to talk about a subject that we don't near, know near enough about because we've not spent near enough time thinking about it and, and looking into it as Scripture talks to us about it, and that is the glory of God. Everything is to be to the glory of God. And that includes me and you. The lives we live are to be to his glory. And when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we're exposed to the radiance of the glory of God. Not only that, we become witness to the very nature of God. He is the exact imprint of God's nature. You want to know what God's like? You want to become familiar with God? Then look at Jesus. Become familiar with Jesus. Because when you do that, then you become familiar with God. The exact imprint of the nature of God. Beyond that, He is the power and authority that upholds the entire universe. Now that... <laughs> wow. Um... Everything is held together by Christ. And we can think about that ter in terms of the vastness of the universe. It is so immense. It boggles our minds. Our minds aren't capable of fully comprehending the vastness of the universe. But it also includes that which is down to the extreme smallest, the atomic, the subatomic level, the, and whatever goes beyond that. 
It's all held together by his power and by his authority. But finally, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we are witnessing and we are looking at, we are beholding our exalted Savior, the one who made purification for my sin and for yours. And because he did all of that, God has exalted him above all else. You know, that, that launches the book, into the book of Hebrews, which talks about the superiority of Jesus, the superiority of Jesus to angels and to Moses and his sacrifice and as a priest and all of the things that are in this great, great book. Fix your eyes on Jesus. It's the only way that we're able to face the life that we're faced with. You know, sometimes we sing a hymn that says, Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. But sometimes we can't even look that far. Because he lives, I can face today. Or even because he lives, I can face this moment. Now, you may be one who is struggling. Uh, you may be one who is hurting or confused or restless or disappointed. Well, there is an answer to this. And that answer is fixing your eyes on Jesus. Thank you for this opportunity tonight.